All right, well, welcome to uh, this mid-November learning session. Uh, I'm Liz Baxter and I'm uh, with North Sound Accountable Community of Health with North Sound ACH. And we're just really excited to have this topic and uh, hope that you will wanna do more once we get done here, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, would like to start with our land acknowledgement and you know, I think especially this month with it being Native American Heritage Month, uh, there are a lot of activities going on around the region that I hope that you all are taking advantage of. Uh, lots of invitations that are sitting amongst the eight tribes, so please do so. Uh, we begin by acknowledging with humility that the land where we are today is the territory of the people of the Salish Sea. Their presence is imbued in the waterways, shorelines, valleys, and mountains of the traditional homelands of the Coast Salish people since time immemorial. And then as always, we have this link uh, down at the bottom of the slide uh, that is a way for you to go and see what uh, land that you were on, whether it's where you are today or where you've been in the past. Uh, it's kept going by uh, a nonprofit up in British Columbia, and it just has been a really great resource for us. I'm gonna get to share a couple of housekeeping items. And so one of the things we want you to do is uh, in the chat, if you will introduce yourself, your name, your pronouns, your organization, uh, we're gonna be using the chat function throughout the session but we are gonna be using the Q&A function if as Malenko is speaking, if you've got a question that just kind of pops up, if you'll put it in the Q&A, then we won't have to go back and kind of look through the chat to see where in that scroll that I remember seeing a really important question. So you can use that uh, as you're looking at your bar down at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can see the raise hand function. We'll be using that later on. Uh, there is a, button for interpretation. We do have some uh, participants today who asked for interpreter. We have two interpreters that are going to be working with us. So you can use that uh, button to make sure that you actually can get to listen uh, to the session in uh, Spanish, if that's the, the choice that you have. So just make sure you take a look at that. You know, I feel like even after four years, I'm still finding like, oh my gosh, I didn't know there was that button on Zoom. So hoping that we're all kind of learning uh, together. And then lastly, you know, even though you're going to have like this um, screen with slides and such, you know, if when you are talking, if you could go ahead and have yourself on screen on camera, uh, that way we'll get to uh, enjoy seeing you as well as listening to you. So thank you for that. The meeting is being recorded. And uh, one of the things that I've been asked to do, and because we always save it to the, the very last slide, is to just ask you to get ready to fill out the post-session survey. Uh, it's a really great way for us to not only hear how this session went, but for us to think about topics that we should be looking at uh, as we move into 2024, believe it or not. It's amazing. Um, and so those are kind of the housekeeping pieces. So I, I get the uh, joy and honor of um, telling you a little bit about why we asked uh, Malenko Madinovich to join us today. Um, I have spent probably 25, 30 years doing community engagement sessions, most of it in Oregon. And throughout the last couple of years, we have had many conversations about how are we doing around facilitation? You know, I think COVID, social justice issues have just brought some really challenging conversations uh, to play. And we're always trying to figure out how do we learn from people who are in the communities that we work with. And I got introduced uh, to Malenko, I want to say like maybe seven-ish years ago, uh, when the Pomegranate Institute was doing trainings around community engagement and facilitation. And a couple of our staff did join that. And so about, uh, I'm going to say maybe a year plus ago, because Malenko, I think you joined us in la the last January and the last August uh, convenings. We have been talking with Malenko about how 
we can see this as a capacity building opportunity for all the partners who are part of the Collaborative Action Network. And Malenko agreed to come on and work with us and be on this journey with us. And, uh, and I'm going to let Malenko tell you a little bit about his background specifically, but, you know, just so grateful that we have somebody who doesn't necessarily see this as a training and then we're done, but really a journey that we're all on to try and become better engaged with the communities that we work with. So Malenko, with that, I'm going to turn it to you and thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you, Liz. There you I'm go. <laughs> delighted to be here, and I'm. Um, uh, I must confess that I prefer to see people eye to eye, face to face. But we'll do our best. We'll do our best today. So, um, as a way of introduction, and following up on Liz's statement. I believe we are all in a kindergarten trying to learn what a collaborative democracy feels like and is like, and that we need to change some habits and protocols to, to achieve that goal. Uh, so, um, Joy, if you can shift to an, the next slide, please. My background, uh, is combining art with uh, community engagement. So uh, long time ago in former Yugoslavia, now Slovenia, where I come from, uh, I, I was uh, worked as an artist, came to the United States, and then uh, eventually started a nonprofit called Pomegranate Center. Um, and one of the main programs was to create spaces that you see on this slide. Um, um, the methodology was that community members would tell us what needs they have, what ought to happen in a particular space. Usually the space was either neglected or misused. Uh, uh, by crime, prostitution, drug dealing. And so when communities came to us, they said, can we change this around? And, and we would say yes, uh, provided that you work with us along the whole journey. We cannot do it for you, but we can together uh, uh, create something special and you need to be involved. And so they gave us the ideas, we then, interpret it with their help, those ideas, and put them into design. And then in a barn raising fashion, they, we all work together to create these spaces. So um, on the bottom right, you can see kind of a constellation of people. They were young and old uh, of all races that would work together. That slide is from San Diego, where we created this in four days together. The slide above it is from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, after the tornado and all the materials that we used were the debris from the uh, uh, tornado. So fallen trees, uh, recycled metal, and so on. Uh, so you get the idea. What I'm going to share with you today is what I've learned on that journey about community engagement. And one of the key themes that I will try to impress on you is that it's more than meetings, that community engagement can be all kinds of activities. It can often start with meetings, but it can be stretched out in participatory activities in, that lead to co-ownership. So with that, uh, I will uh, turn it back to Joy and, and we will have a grounding experience for you uh, to, to start thinking about the nature of community engagement. So Joy, do you want to take it over? Absolutely. So we have a Mentimeter question for us. I believe our groups have gotten to do these a couple of times before. Uh, in the chat, we will have the Mentimeter link and code, and uh, and then 
a couple of minutes afterwards, Malika is going to take it right back over so we can look at responses and expand and maybe see what kind of questions come up. And Malenko, I will hand it off to you so that you can take a peek at the responses and see if there's anything that you might want to expand on or if there's if there's any audience participation you'd be interested in taking right now. I, I would like to also, uh, there are lots of comments that I see here that are kind of a sh showing the joyful side of community engagement. I wonder if some of you also have a more challenging side where something did not work, and I would like to see your experience with that. So uh, one challenge I have faced is getting members of the community excited and engaged in projects. My positive outcomes have come from the community members who collaborate. Um, that's a great summary. It's created new and innovative solutions, which I agree with. Community engagement, when done right, surfaces all kinds of insights. Um, Can you scroll down a little bit more to more comments? Oops. So uh, can you stop uh, individuals who come with an agenda to disrupt the work for the sake of disrupting? Um, that I hear almost from every group that I work with. Not inviting the right people, so let's talk about that. The low attendance, yeah. Not having a plan to look back with the community once we have gathered the, their input. This is where that point that I was making about stretching the engagement into all phases of the project, not just an initial phase. These are great comments. Absolutely. Malenko, let me know whenever you're ready and we can hop back into your presentation. So, uh, Joy, let's ask a couple of people to, to highlight what they were saying. And I will not choose them if they can just volunteer to start uh, uh, this discussion. Anybody yeah. want to anybody want to jump in? Oh, I can I can say something. I was the one who mentioned that one of the challenges I had is getting people interested, excited, and engaged. Um, and once you find those people, it really takes off and things are amazing. But it's really, for me, it's been a hurdle to find the people who are interested in taking those next action steps together. Thank you. Uh, I will address uh, a, a possible solution for that based on my experience. And who, who was that that was chatting? Oh, that's me. I'm Chloe Martin from United General District 304. Nice. Thank you. Since I can't see you, I at least want to know who you are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Chloe. Anybody else want to jump in? Um, I could offer something. This is Sarah O'Connor from Ferndale Community Services up in Ferndale, Washington. Um, we are... Uh, in the process of working on a safe parking project that is really not being well received by our community. And so one of our challenges is just misinformation about homelessness and its existence in my small town. And so um, one of the issues there is just 
how on the other hand, it's it's been very engaging. People are very engaged and it's led to us identifying people who really do want to be involved. So there's been a positive there, but the other piece is just dealing with the misinformation. And what we've realized is that we're going to have to do a lot of community education as part of community engagement too. And so I guess um, any wisdom that you have about that piece would be helpful. Uh, I, I, I will address that uh, uh, within the boundaries of a short presentation that we have today, yes. Thanks, Sarah. One last one. Anybody want to jump in? I've got something I can jump in. Hi. Um, just another challenge that um, I found is having to do asynchronous community engagement, right? So when you can't collect everyone together at the same time and just the difficulty in building a sense of community um, through those kinds of surveys and other collection methods. I, I'm with you. Um, and Let's talk about all of these things. Thank you so much for, for helping uh, get warmed up around this complex topic of community engagement. Joy, if you can shift back into my PowerPoint. Uh, what I'll do next is uh, uh, bear with me. This is my presentation time. I will jump into this topic and then I will ask, we'll have time at the end for your comments. I'll start with this image. This was a painting done at the closure of a, in a, an elementary school um, here in the Puget Sound area uh, where children, teachers and alumni express a lot of sadness about the closure of the school, which they were very fond of, but it had to be torn down because of problems like asbestos. And so the, the PTA came to me and said, can, what can we do with this moment of sadness? What can we do to, to channel this somehow? And nearby was a, a heron rookery. So children could see herons taking flight. And the principal said, let's do something that shows us uh, the new beginning. So, so that was the framework. Uh, what I proposed is this painting that was done with handprints and fingerprints of every child in the school. And on the bottom, you see little lines on, on a kind of on a water. Those are signatures of the alumni of the school who came to that event. So this was done over two days um, of uh, pe people putting their hands and fingers on this painting. And now it lives in the, the library of the new school. And I was told people still come there and identify the spot where they touch this painting. So, so, so uh, I'm using this to illustrate some principles. Next slide, please. So, Context number one, what I would like you to all understand, which I had to understand very early in my work, which started in, you know, I started Pomegranate Center in 1986. So, so I've been at this for a long time. But the facilitators are more than managing, more than managers of meetings that they actually have to learn how to orchestrate this dance with a lots of partners in addition to people from the community. So in this instance, um, and that relates to the painting that you saw, there were funders who have their own expectations who I had to talk with. Uh, there were project initiators, which was, uh, as I told you, were uh, children basically saying, we don't want to lose this school. Then there were experts who, uh, like myself, artists, and there were some artists with particular sensibilities that were contrary to mine. One I remember um, said, oh, artists work alone. That's what artists are. And, and you are trying to get everybody involved. How do we know that the quality will still be there? Is that those kind of uh, all kinds of dynamics happen. 
the community, we had a community meeting about that and they had their own opinions. You know, some people wanted this and some people wanted that. None wanted what I eventually presented and the community liked. Then there were interest groups. That's an interesting dynamic because some parents uh, kind of influenced by uh, the media, by the films, by Disney, wanted cute things, something that would, would directly say this is for children, you know, cartoons, uh, uh, rainbows. And when I proposed something that is actually a serious painting, they didn't get it. They they want they promoted this idea of, of of let's have something cute because children do not understand anything else or uh, that kind of a sentiment. Traditions play themselves out, uh, and then there are decision makings decision makers in a project like this who actually decides. In my instance of this particular painting. It was the community that decided, the community of parents and children. I proposed the idea, I showed them a sketch and I said, Do you, does this work for you? Um, and and uh, we jointly decided. So what I want to impress is that facilitators stand in the center of all this dance in your projects. That dance may be very different, but chances are that you would have city ordinances, design criteria that the city has adopted. You will certainly have budget considerations. You would certainly have interest groups uh, that would show up with their particular agendas. So uh, context number one, facilitators need to create meetings that show this dance and are respectful of this dance and trying to find a solution that works for everyone. That's a very artful thing to do. Next slide, please. Context number two. Uh, there are always dynamics between external community, which is community of differences. So we now, most of us live in neighborhoods where people next door may be of different religion, sometimes of different economic uh, layer, sometimes of a different race, different ages. So in my, I live in a neighborhood in Bellevue, Washington, and I have neighbors from all over the world here. In fact, we will have a community meeting in my home tonight to decide what we can do about environmental um, issues. What can individuals do? But it's all different people. And, and community work that I do and I learned about is working with those differences. Then the other dynamic that happens is that the team that is working, in my instance, was the internal community of my, we had, a small team of about seven people that ran the organization and then extended team of designers and artisans and builders who worked with us as volunteers. And that is all based on the community of trust. And there is this wonderful tension that happens between the eternal community of people who, who need to work as a team and build trust with each other and how to be consistent with that trust building with the external community that is community of differences. So this context, uh, I want you just to remember that ultimately the consist consistency between two, those two levels of work pays back. And if you cannot, uh, what I've learned is you cannot expect from the external community to build trust if you do not exhibit it internally in your team. Context number three, next slide, please. So this is a sub slide of what I just saying. Uh, sociologists now talk about bridging and bonding as two ways to build the community. Bonding is about surrounding ourselves with people who think like ourselves, who, who may be of same, uh, uh, with whom we uh, 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 share 
uh, family trends, uh, uh, affinity, friendships, uh, who are who have same traditions. And that's the easy way to build a community. It's natural, I should say. It's not easy. Uh, we all may have relatives with whom we have challenges. But it's natural way to look, surround ourselves with those with whom we share some bonds. And the hard work these days is the bridging way to build a community, which is to intentionally reach out to those who are different, those who may um, uh, be now complete, completely uh, 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 different from my comfort zone, and what now, right? And the fact is that, so as I said before, so many of us now live in communities where that is happening. Uh, and we have a tremendous opportunity, I think, to turn those differences into something useful. Now, context number four. Next slide, please. So it's really kind of a short four step dance that we all find ourselves in. Uh, about this dynamic of how to deal with differences. We used to punish them and isolate people who were different in whatever way, away from those who, who had some more power. And we played that, that game very successfully and still do. We then suggested that we need to learn to tolerate differences. Um, we then say we now need to celebrate the differences, not just tolerate them. And you are all familiar with events that happen in, in the spirit of those uh, uh, tolerations and celebrations, progress happened. I happen to believe uh, that now we are at the brink of a fourth step where we intentionally say what we can learn from each other differences to improve our society, that the collective knowledge that we have needs to be combined for us to, to actually make sense of what we need to do as a society, uh, as humans, to make it work into the future. So remember these four kind of a contextual things as I now jump into the model that I would encourage you to think about with me. Next slide, please. So what I've learned is that um, it's, a, a, it's a cycle of work that facilitators need to negotiate, that the work of facilitators is this pink line surrounding the center and that somebody needs to manage that. Um, it starts with wiring for success, that um, ask, asking the questions, does this project need to happen by few people who go spring into action, or does it need to go through community journey so that more people own the, the results? Both journeys, folks, are equally valid. So for example, uh, I'm a great fan of great music, and I'm glad that those musicians do not need to have convening groups and community input in order to, to create their music. They, they simply spring into action. Uh, when I had hard problems with my health, I was glad that there was no focus group to decide what to do with it, that the wise doctor was able to prescribe a stand for my vein and inserted it immediately. In those instances, community journey would be an obstruction. So wiring for success is really discerning what projects merit a large community engagement. When you decide that that's what needs to happen, we advise that you assemble what I call a convening group, not a focus group, not an advisory group, not a steering group, because all those names suggest certain different leadership group, uh, leadership capacity. A convening group suggests a group of people who help you orchestrate a great, great community meeting. One of you talked about how 
uh, it's hard to to trust who will come to the community meetings uh, and how to uh, ensure that critical differences of people come to the community meeting. Well, community convening group is one of the methods to accomplish that because you, I encourage in those community projects, you assemble a group of emerging and existing leaders who represent different facets of the community and with their help, orchestrate a powerful community meeting and ask them to outreach for the project. So they personally uh, reach out to their networks to bring people to the community meeting. So step number three then is one or a series of community meetings. And in the first community meeting, I always ask people, everyone in a group to answer the same question and everybody has a chance to speak. This is important because I found out that without that, uh, that people, uh, that, that meetings would be uh, taken over by, by few vocal people and everybody else would be silent. And so I would suggest certain code of behavior, how we should uh, uh, agree to conduct uh, ourselves with each other, and then everybody participates. Um, and uh, uh, I, I will use an artistic image here. It's a little bit like pointillist uh, paintings of French Impressionists who use dots uh, to, uh, to put on a canvas and then the image emerged basically by the viewer combining those dots into an image. When you engage the community where everyone participates, something similar happens, that, that lots of people uh, you realized will have different perspectives on, on the same issue. Some people look through this issue through the lens of uh, beauty, some through equity, some through design, some through financial realities, some through uh, uh, um, community building. And I realized that all those modalities are equally valuable and that I, we need to all not only present our ideas, but listen to those of others. And when that is, is done right, suddenly magic begins to happen because people realize that their preferred idea is not the only one. And they need to now start thinking how to create solutions with multiple goals wired into them. So community engagement in this sense is, is a method of turning those differences into unified strategies. Then the design on the bottom right is that every project, once you assemble ideas, needs to be boiled down into something uh, that is much simpler, but embodies those larger, that, that larger matrix of issues that you hear from the community. Uh, uh, in my opinion, design is a little bit like, uh, uh, like making maple syrup where 40, uh, 40 gallons of sap eventually make one gallon of syrup. So it's boiling down. It's not replacing what you heard from the community, but it means it needs to be boiled down. Um, there is a tension that can happen between community wanted to micromanage designs. I, I learned that it's really useful to have a, a, a relationship of trust between the community and designers, where we ask the community to, to empower the designers to, to do this boiling down process. But the designers need to promise to build it, bring it back to the community so, so that community has the right to say yes or no. And then all this moves into what we came to call early success, where we started to continue to engage community, but this time not around ideas, but doing something on behalf of the project. So for example, in one project, 
the early success was to organize uh, a wood carving sessions to carve two doors leading to a future community center. So the same people who gave us ideas were now invited to, to uh, work under the direction of a carver to, to create designs and carvings for exact dimensions of doors that would be then placed into the future building, the opening ceremony. Then it all moves into the construction building where a festival gets enacted, when the community garden gets built, when the community center gets built and so on and so forth. And then we always encourage at the end for the key players in this journey to get together and see what they've learned and, and see how they can do it better next time around. Next slide, please. So I'm quickly going to deconstruct each step. Convening group is in our recommendation, 12 to 20 members, existing and emerging leaders that represent range of expertise, lived experience and demographic diversity. So here is a, 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 an example of a, a picture of a, a, an exemplary, uh, uh, convening group, and you would see high school students alongside with seniors, and you would see all kinds of expertise rolled together. And it's a mini uh, uh, representation of the larger community. Next slide, please. Uh, community, in a community meetings, what I've learned, what makes it work is not to be afraid for people to uh, uh, uphold certain uh, um, ground rules, code of conduct, because I've learned how easily uh, the, the, the process can be hijacked by negativity and by people who have uh, uh, agendas different from what the purpose of the meeting and the project is about. Uh, the second, element is that each project needs to have clearly defined project criteria, which is basically a list of things of what is possible with a project, giving the funding and regulations and whatnot, and what is not possible. So that you encourage people to give you ideas that are realistic, that fit in with these, uh, the project's goals, and then the third part is clear st meeting structure so that the meeting has a beginning, has a middle point and the end. Next slide, please. So examples of ground rules that we use that everyone participates. So I would say, do you agree that in this meeting, everyone should participate, that we will restrain from blaming and complaining so if somebody does complain, I would ask them, how can you turn that around? How do you propose something better instead? Um, that uh, in view of new information that we may hear, do you agree to be willing to change your mind? Uh, so it is not a meeting where we constantly hear the same idea repeated and people use the meeting to convert people to their way of thinking. but encourage uh, a situation where some learning happens and we collectively surface some solutions that make sense. And finally, an example would be that it's okay for people to use data as, a, as an example of knowledge, but also their feelings. Uh, uh, so for example, a mother talking about the necessity to keep their her children safe is as valuable as, as the st statistical idea uh, uh, data. Do you agree, community members, to that all of those modalities are okay? So those are just examples, and we encourage every community to to craft their own list of of such uh, ground rules. Next slide, please. So project criteria, I already mentioned that, what is possible, what is not, and third, yes, next slide. So the, set the scene, 
consists of basically project backgrounds that needs to be cl clearly articulated. Um, and uh, so I encourage people to spend a lot of time with the help of a convening group to make a short presentation that succinctly explains the goals and purposes and criteria of the project so that in step number two, where people generate ideas, those, generate, uh, those ideas are relevant to the nature of the project. Um, and then every meeting should explain to people where their input would go next, what you as a facilitator plan to do with that input and how you will regroup so you can see the progress. And the general rule here is that the end of every meeting should be the beginning of the next one. Next slide, please. Often processes have more than one meeting and if that happens, then the second meeting uh, uh, is different from the first one uh, where everybody works in a large group that we encourage you break into small groups and people uh, uh, start drawing what goes where. And drawing is more than just design of physical spaces. It can be drawing for uh, design of a festival. Uh, but we, we've learned uh, that when people use their hands, a new ins that new insights would emerge, which are very valuable to the success of the project. Next slide, please. When uh, so in our work, we had to design uh, both uh, conceptual and technical drawings for, for these gathering places that I showed you images of. Uh, and we would organize a, a design workshop that would last as long as two days where selected community members who were so inclined who had some community expertise and design expertise would join our team, analyze all the ideas and sketches and create a concept, develop some details around that concept and, and prepare a series of drawings to present at the third community meeting. Next slide, please. And then in the third community meeting, we would, number two the, here, we would share design concepts, ask what improvements are needed and organize early success projects that I was telling you about, how to keep the momentum going. Next slide, please. So I am also almost at the end of my presentation. Early success is, is is a small project. Sorry, I hear a voice. Was that directed to me? No, okay. So it's a small project to keep the momentum going and keep people engaged. I've learned also that there are some people who are who express what I call visioning fatigue, who do not want to come to another community meeting uh, because they've been maybe uh, had experiences where they were asked for their ideas and so no, saw no evidence that their ideas made any contribution or any change. And so, but what I've learned is some of those same people are eager to come to do something and uh, uh, one of them told me, uh, uh, call me when you're ready to dig ditches or to build something and I will come there. And so uh, can you go to the next, um, here we are on this slide, yeah. So, and what I've learned is that those events 
small events started to attract new supporters for the project who suddenly uh, uh, the circle of ownership increased by doing th those early successes. Um, and uh, so that's it. And, and one more slide, final slide is, so, so the summary of all what I was presenting is uh, that I will encourage you to think about the facilitators' responsibilities to be this, that they need to have clarity at every step and they need to do a lot of homework between every step of the project in order to make it work. That engagement can happen at every step, that alignment with partners, meaning the funders, you remember the slide where facilitators are in, in the middle of a circle with a lot of, of uh, partners dancing around the project, that they're responsible for maintaining that alignment throughout the project. So, so the partners who uh, may be disenchanted with a, where the project is going uh, uh, will be enchanted because they are informed, because they understand what went into it. To keep the momentum going, uh, as fast as possible in the project that I showed you from the Pomegranate Center, we perfected the model so far that between the first community meeting, or I should say first convening group meeting and the uh, ribbon cutting ceremony, uh, we were able to do it in three months from beginning to end. That facilitators need to focus on process, not content. That's a tough one, but it ricochets back to the bridging slide versus bonding. So if 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 facilitators focus on content and try to convince people about the right solution from the beginning, rather than let the solution emerge from the exchange between the community members then they will suffer the consequences. Some people will pull out, other people will feel the victorious that their ideas uh, uh, came uh, to the top and, and won out, so to speak. Facilitators are responsible for suggesting some kind of a code of, uh, ex uh, uh, of conduct for the process and not only suggest it, but protect it throughout the project that there is always follow through, as I said before, the end of every step of the project is beginning of the next one. And finally, uh, facilitation is the art of balancing inclusiveness and decisiveness. This is the end of my presentation. From now on, we will have plenty of time uh, to now discuss this, uh, face your questions, and I'll put it back into Joyce hands. Well, Enko, thank you so much. Um, we are going to break into small groups, and we've got two questions. I thought maybe uh, we could raise those up uh, before uh, we go into the small group sessions. So, the first one was whether you. It says, should we be intentional about limiting the number of meetings to three or less? or should the facilitator be open in extending it to more is needed? Uh, is, is three is three like a, a magic number or just a suggested number? Uh, it's just a suggested number. Okay. And then um, if given the choice, should facilitators focus more on keeping the meeting going or take a pause and focus on building trust and relationships? Um, so if uh, in the cycle that I was suggesting, if each step is taken carefully, you will increase the chances for the process to continue. Uh, if you sense that there are some things that will deter from, from that, I suggest that you create separate meetings to build trust with those who may uh, 
uh, may uh, bring uh, disruption to the community meeting. I think ultimately the facilitator needs to do whatever he, she can do to focus on that community engagement part of the process, but realizing that there may be all kinds of obstacles that are uh, on the road. And it's quite possible that in order to create maximum engagement from the community, you may need to have some smaller meetings with some groups in the community that are not ready to attend community meeting at large uh, with full participation. Then some work needs to happen prior to that meeting. All right. And uh, there, there are two more, and I'm going to hold on to them until we come out of the breakout. So, uh, Joy, can you tell me how long we've got for the breakout sessions? We're going to do 20 minutes for the breakout session. All right. Thank you. Uh, so what we're going to do is just uh, ask you when you get into the small breakouts to like introduce yourself to each other, name, pronouns, organization. And then you see kind of the two questions. They're also uh, going to be in the chat and they're there. So that should hold over when you go into your small groups. And, and then we're going to come back and we will have more time to get to the other questions and also hear uh, some insights from your small group discussions. Welcome back. Hi, welcome back. And I'm just watching the participant number scroll as everybody comes back into the large room. And uh, so there, there were a couple of questions that were sitting, but you know, we would love to know, and we did have like 20-ish breakout rooms, so we're probably not going to go room by room, but if any of you want to just uh, raise a hand and you want to share something surprising, maybe, that came up uh, in your discussion uh, to share with the rest of us. So if you raise your hand, I'll just call on folks as they raise their hand. Lyndon, you're raising your hand without using the Zoom raise your hand thing. So I'm just lucky I can see you. That's because I'm old school, Liz. <laughs> These are hands, okay? We get through this still, okay? I, you know, we had such a great talk that when you said about the questions, I was putting the chat, oh, there were questions. I don't remember what the questions were we were supposed to talk about because the three of us just took off running with, with, kind of things that are going on in our communities because you put me with Michelle up in from uh from Queer Collective up in Bellingham oh, and, uh, and Helen from uh, Snohomish County Health and oh my god we just had an amazing discussion and I don't even remember what the questions were but I it was a great discussion <laughs> so is there some is there something you want to lift up from what the three of you chatted about Collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. That we need, we need partnering, partnering. And I've known that since since PFLAG joined um, joined this group is that that is where the strength is. And how to I love I've loved the slides I've been talking about this. And and we also talked about some of the issues with collaboration, which is if you're a nonprofit and you're all volunteer, it looks a whole lot different than when you have employees who can be designated to do these kinds of collaborations. So Michelle and I were just sort of commiserating about bodies. How do you how do you recruit bodies to work on these? There's so much need. And how do you recruit bodies to take the pressure off of one or two people in the organization? Awesome. Thanks, Lyndon. And and even though Lyndon's old school, I'm going to encourage you to use the raise hand on Zoom. Since I can't see everybody, um, I'll be able. Well, I don't know if you all notice this, but if you raise your hand, you like get to the front of the picture line. So, uh, Ara, jump on in. I jumped to the top of the picture line. I know. Um, <laughs> thanks, Liz. <laughs> um, so I brought up two things that were kind of coming up for me. So first off, we we chatted about like you know um. So it seems like the the meetings that we were talking about, like this seems more like, um, what's the word? Like it's heading towards a goal. Like it's a short term, here's a goal, here's a purpose. These are the purpose of the community meetings. Like 
uh, of like this present, but the facilitation that I do internally at CHS is more long term. So like it's like oh the community. Um, so one of the things that I brought up that really resonated with me that was briefly mentioned, I believe, was like community agreements. Like I think that community agreements with longer term um, relationship building types of meetings. That's like oh it's happening more habitually. We do it once a month, once every two weeks. Like I think that those community agreements were so pivotal. But like we put it into practice here at CHS. And first off, it's a really great, like, oh, this is us gathering as a team. It's a nice W, it's a nice win for a team to be like, hey, this is what we agreed upon. This is what we'll uphold and X, Y, Z. Um, and so those community agreements are something that we, we really build a foundation of that team building, that bonding, that trust, um, that, 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 that will help fuel the rest of our future meetings. So that's one, the community um, agreements. And then secondly, um, with the second question, is there a part of the model that you would find helpful to clarify or expand upon? One thing I brought up was trust building and repair. I think trust building is an incredibly, um, it's so subjective. Trust is really subjective. And sometimes you'll never gain my trust. Like sometimes like whatever action X, Y, Z, like you'll never really fully gain like whatever trust you think I should be giving you. But does that mean that I we are incapable of working together or does it just mean like distance and boundaries? It's like, hey, this is our purpose or mission. I still wanna collaborate with you. Even if like, I'm not quite trusting. Trust is so subjective, right? It's like, I trust my coworkers to get the job done, to do their part in the end, to bring what they need to do to the meeting. I trust that part. But like for me, as someone from marginalized community, trust is like, mm, you, you you represent like a system, an, an oppressive system, a, a, a perspective that um, may be harmful towards my community. What trust can be built there? But we still need to work together. So tr I think trust is like one of those and then repair because inevitably, especially with meetings that happen more habitually, um, it's gonna happen. Ruptures will happen, harm will happen, oppression will happen. It's human nature for us to disagree and and, and for things to, to fall apart sometimes. And so that repair work afterwards, I would, I always love additional resources and how we can continue. How do we move past? No, I don't wanna say move past. How do we acknowledge that the rupture happened? How can we come up with like different ways of finding ways of how repair can look like post? Because it's gonna look different with every single relationship, every single rupture. So repair work, I think, so trust building and repair work are things that I, center in my day-to-day -day work is something that I bring into the community spaces and it's also like a balancing act so just some I like to throw a lot of big things um so yeah trust building and repair and community agreements thanks Ara and Keiko I see your hand Malenko I didn't know if there was anything you wanted to jump in on yet or should I just go to Keiko go to Keiko please and then all right all right fantastic Keiko, go on ahead. Um, Ara, I just wanted to say I love everything Ara says. And, and um, in our group, we uh, talked a little bit about how what I love about this um, method is that I really feel like it's important to start with the internal organization itself with this method. And, um, you know, just kind of and that's part of that was uh, Malenko, you've mentioned like the 50 hours of preparation for one hour of community meeting. But, um, you know, I just, uh, I just find this a valuable uh, lens to kind of look internally um, within the organization and, and build that kind of iterative model of success um, as part of the work of presenting it to an external community. Um, so I'm super, just a super big fan of, of uh, this method. And, um, and going back to Ara's, uh, you know, uh, points about building trust and 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 trust is also um, a function of understanding, too, and alignment. And um, so, yeah, I just uh, I, I love that the way this method is is also an internal um, method of of building um, a kind of relational trust and also um, aligning of of uh, mission and values and um and then it strengthens that outcome when you bring it to the external community as well. Thanks Keiko. Uh Jessica. 
Yes, thank you. Um, there was a question that came up in our group, which was um, when we're convening and it turns out that there's a hidden agenda that's um, seeking to undermine the, the efforts and the collaboration that's being built, what's what's a way that that can be addressed and unearthed and, and attended to, or um, is there a norm that should be um, shared or something at the beginning? I don't know, yeah. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, Keiko, you mentioned how, uh, Keiko took my training workshops and uh, I would repeat this, how important for facilitators is all the homework between every step. It does take a lot of precise homework to make it work uh, in real time. So, so the dynamic is that basically you have limited time with the community to build that trust. You have much longer time to build trust with your team. Uh, and so uh, I think um, working with community, uh, my experience was that uh, in order to get inclusion that we need in order to trust the results of the input from the community, we could not drag the process endlessly. So, so then the challenge is how to build that trust in a very short period of time. So in our meetings, and I alluded to that in the slides, we had three meetings, none of them longer than two hours in which all the major decisions with the community were, had to be made. Why? Because we discovered it, if we stretch two hours or three meetings formula, people who should be at the meeting stopped coming because they have responsibilities with their second job and their families and so on. So here's the tension then, right? How to build trust under those conditions is different than building trust with your team where you meet every week, where you have team meetings. But the two do resonate with each other. And Keiko, thank, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, that if you... Uh, build that trust on your team, you st start sending out a quality to the community meeting that people un maybe unconsciously start to trust. They say, here are some people who did their homework, they are prepared well, they presented it succinctly, and they kept to the essence, they did not go on, they did not go down the rabbit holes, did not project an agenda. And so, so that's one of the golden rule of, of uh, the uh, uh, facilitator. You need to be neutral as you facilitate, no matter what your agenda is. And, and so one of the things that uh, then I suggest, uh, Jessica, is that the facilitators need to understand all those dynamics and ensure that by the time they come to the community meetings, with the help of the convening group, all those concerns would bubble up to the surface and you have a way to anticipate them and, and stop them before they happen. That's why 50 hours is so important. Creating an agenda for the meeting takes five minutes. Creating the right agenda for the meeting takes hours. You know, and, and so the, so that's one suggestion is just to taking that preparation very seriously being neutral when you facilitate uh, and not betray your where you want the results to be. If you already have those results in mind, don't call the community together and don't call it community engagement, call it an open house. Here's what we decided, we want to share it with you. That's very different from community engagement where you want to solicit ideas from the people, right? So, so, uh, so that those are my basic uh, uh, considerations I would have you think about as you embark on this journey of community engagement. It, um, the hardest thing is to be neutral. And one of the things I would suggest to all of you, since you're partners under the umbrella of ACH, 
help each other facilitate your own internal meetings so somebody from another organization can facilitate your meeting in order to increase the chances of neutrality. That's why we bother to do all those trainings is to give some shared skills, you know, some, I don't know how many, 60 people went through, through a more detailed training. Uh, so that imagine a situation where your organization needs a community meeting. And instead of you who are in charge in succeeding with the project, also serve as a facilitator. You call on someone say, hey, Mary, hey, Joseph, can you come and run this meeting for us? Work with us and you are going to be in charge of the process so I can fo focus on the content and on the criteria. This is, could be a simple uh, first step that all you, of you can do to help each other with community engagement. Thanks, Malenko. I'm, I'm gonna go back to a couple of the questions that are in the Q&A section. Uh, so one was uh, just wanting to kind of hear your thoughts on um, when you're doing engagement with communities where you're not culturally familiar with those communities, just any additional recommendations that you might have? Yeah, so uh, in some ways I've been lucky because I'm an immigrant to this country and, and I do not have, there's no Slovenian uh, group that is promoting its agenda. So in, in some ways I've been lucky not to belong to, to one particular culture. Uh, which makes me curious more naturally. I'm really curious about how different people solve their problems, go about uh, life uh, and try to learn. So that the first step is just try to be curious and learning. And I know this is hard lift because we unconsciously all have biases. Um, we, and I have biases as all of us do, you know. Um, we have cognitive biases, like we only accept the information that fits our point of view, right? So I think being a facilitator then uh, carries with it certain responsibility uh, for uh, not assuming certain things automatically, um, not having a preconceived agenda, as I said before, it's fine to have an agenda and separate the meetings into engaging community with your decisions that are, were already made and engaging communities in order to make the decisions. Those are two different kinds of modalities. But in communicate, community engagement, I think learning, often I would go to the groups and have one-on-one -on -one meeting to try to understand what matters to them they were hesitant to come to the community meetings because they did not know what to expect or they had bad experience, bad experience with community meetings in the past. So some trust building had to happen and it had to happen quickly. The best way I go is visit people on their territory in their setting and say, we are planning to do this. Help me understand what it would take for you to be engaged with this process. And then there's some give and take. So for example, in one community in Salishan in Tacoma, very diverse housing authority community, one of the groups said, we, do not, we don't ever share in a public meetings because we bring the information back to our elders who tell us what to, where to go, and then we'll bring that information back. Now, I said, can we find a sweet spot between that modality and, and a community meeting where everybody can participate? So for example, can you bring your elders to that meeting? It's only two hours. You know, and we negotiated those solutions so that the momentum that the community requires for its indicators of success, that the momentum could be kept and decisions could still be made. You know, so I encourage you to, to, to think about uh, that preliminary homework, those 50 hours of visiting uh, uh, pockets of community that would not come to the community engagement process, 
but you want them to come in order to trust that the solutions will work for all. So some of that homework will need to happen. Liz, I hope this is enough for what you had. In <laughs> There's always more. Um, it is. Yeah, so the next question I, I kind of think is how to, how to go slow and go fast, um, but how to uh, express to the convening group the importance of the meetings and engagement when the group is just ready to make decisions and go, go, go. Okay. So in my methodology, and I wrote the answer for that one, oh, did you? the group is there to assemble the community, not to make the decisions for the community. So that's why I call it a convening group. You're convening, you're not deciding. Uh, help us gather the community. Uh, it sounds to me that whoever wrote that question is really thinking of a small group who is uh, that is an advisory group or a steering group or, or a council of some kind that's been charged to move ahead and make decisions for the community. If that is the case, then don't go to the community to, to bother with, uh, with an additional step and make those decisions. As I said before, there are situations where that is per perfectly legitimate and needed. And knowing the difference, however, is very important. Having clarity, is this a community journey or is it a journey of a small group with already fixed agenda or goals that they have determined they need to implement? Uh, so having that clarity will make a lot of difference later on. Um, uh, so to answer the question specifically, the convening groups should not make the decisions in a community engagement journey. The community should make the decisions and community, convening group members should gather the community, help gather the community so that they can make clear decisions. Awesome. Uh, Mike Cohen, are you still on? And maybe you want to jump in and talk about your question? Yeah, I will. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm the director of the Bellingham Food Bank. Um, I've often observed that in governmental situations, their processes are long, both the meetings and then the number of meetings, and then poorly facilitated. So what feels like fringe folks can really dominate. I'm just curious if you have any um, suggestions as to how to disrupt that, that process, which then excludes lots of grassroots community members because they can't hang in there for a year or two years worth of two and three hour meetings, which can have a lot of shouting and not be really safe spaces for many community groups. Yes, thank you, Mike. Uh, you know, uh, in my early years of Palm Grad Center, I was a novice, I was new to this country. Uh, I did not understand how the system works. I was surprised because from, from Across the Atlantic Ocean, I looked at the United States with, with lots of envy. Uh, I read about town meetings in New England, and I said, wow, can you imagine a society where people came together and jointly discerned what needs to happen, understood the situation together, and then agreed to the solution to the next steps. Then I, when I came to the country, I saw what you were talking about, Mike. I went to the first community meeting. It was about widening a bike path that I use, so I had personal interest. And the, the people who were running the meeting were basically opposing uh, creating a bike path because I think they really dislike bicyclists because they disrupted their life a little bit because they had to stop for them, be more careful. But they never said that. What they said was, we not want to preserve the character of our community. And they had this noble language about uh, 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 what they cared about. But underneath was clear to me, but uh, there was just a big no. We don't want this, and you better live with it. This bike path has still not been built 30 years or 40 years later since I met uh, was at the meeting because of that attitude. I started to attend other meetings. I noticed the same pattern that they were manipulated by a handful of people with a, an agenda and who convinced everybody in the room either forcefully 
or, or through controlling the proceedings about the predetermined uh, conclusion. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I started Pomegranate Center. I say, wait a minute, my idealism that I had about democracy, where is it? How come that this is not working in a, what I consider to be a birthplace of participatory democracy and collaborative democracy? And so I, I said, do I have as an immigrant here, as a, what my wife calls me, a, a imported American, uh, do I have the audacity to do something about it? But that's how I started. And I want to tell you, Mike and others, that I've been uh, sent back to my communist country of origin several times because of that uh, uh, intent to say, let's better our democratic processes. Um, so those people exist and, and people with agendas exist. Uh, uh, my colleagues at Pomegranate Center and I started to guess what category of uh, obstruction we will get from what people, because we can see them in their, detect that attitude in their body language. And so we saw the naysayers, we saw the, the uh, curmudgeons, we saw the uh, conspiracy theories, we saw um, uh, um, people who talked forever, long-winded people who felt that they deserve more time than other people and would take forever to make a point. A lot of our ground rules or code of conduct came because we saw how easily community engagement could be hijacked by those people. And now how to equalize the field. So a simple ground rule. Do you agree that everybody participates allows me to say to a long-winded person, say, uh, you know, we agree that uh, everybody needs to participate in this meeting. I will go to the next person. I'm concerned that if everybody takes the same amount of time, we will not hear from some people. Can you come to the point? What is your suggestion to the question that we're asking tonight? It's, I had uh, maybe three, four, instances where people were so offended by me doing that, that they walked out. But after they walked out and their footsteps were not heard there anymore, everybody burst into applause because that person was a nuisance forever in their community. So I heard one person's feeling, but everybody <laughs> was rejoiced that, that, I, that, I, that I suggested we could do better. So Mike, uh, I don't know if that begins to answer it, but as I said at, uh, in my presentation, there's three ingredients to a successful community meeting. One is this code of conduct, what we should expect from each other. Second is clear criteria. What, in other words, what are we debating? What is the goal which gives you as a facilitator the right to say, this is a legitimate concern, but not for tonight. Let's put it in a parking lot of issues. We, let's talk with a city council person later on or city manager, but tonight we cannot do with a garbage disposal questions. This is about community center. We're discussing that. And have that, that's what I mean by protecting the structure of the meeting. And the third one is this clarity of the structure. First, I'll explain the project. Second, we'll ask everyone to participate and then we'll tell you the next steps. Every meeting, whether there is a staff meeting or a board meeting or a community meeting should have that structure. Um, so uh, those are some of the tools I would encourage you to utilize to minimize that hijacking that can happen now so naturally and it's happening on a national level in national politics that many of us think that's what democracy is. I happen to think, to think that that's the opposite of the ideal of collaborative democracy, uh, which we are striving for. Thanks so much, Malenko. And I, and I know that we've got other additional questions. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to maybe put some thoughts in writing that we can send out for the questions that we haven't gotten to. Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. All right, thank you so much. Um, 
you know, for those who don't know, I know some of you took part in the trainings that we had set up, uh, but Malenko does this over two days, which gives people a lot of time to practice. And then we asked Malenko to do it in a half day. And now I feel like we asked you to <laughs> cover a lot of ground in an hour. Uh, but, you know, I, the, I just want you all to remember that we are willing, we the ACH, to continue to support this access to this training and practicing because we think it's an incredibly important skill set for uh, the partners to be a part of. So uh, just Malenko, thank you for being on this journey with us and continuing to help us all uh, learn so reminders and and Natalie, I know you put it in the chat a little while ago, but I'm wondering if you could put the feedback survey in the chat again. I uh, would really love for you all to give us your thoughts. Uh, just a reminder, we, we kind of have a window of time that we're looking at for our January convening. So we hope to see you all uh, there uh, still finalizing the location, but again, it'll be in that kind of central central to the five county region location. Uh, we're looking at either the 22nd and 23rd or the 23rd and 24th. I believe those are the dates. It's like the Tuesday, Wednesday or Wednesday, Thursday of that week in January. And uh, just, you know, really excited to continue um, working with you all. And uh, as you see more details, uh, they'll be in all of the newsletters and such. And also want to just point you to our resource library. We're like there are links to recordings from the learning sessions, uh, slide decks that get used. And as soon as we get the recording kind of done and cleaned up, this session will be there as well. So uh, with that, I just want to thank you all for carving out uh, a piece of your day to be with us. And if you have ideas for future learning sessions, we'd love to hear those too. So uh, you can always contact us at team at Northsound ACH dot org and thank you all just uh so much appreciation and gratitude